Hey everyone, I had the great pleasure of chatting this week with the great left-wing media veteran and publishing editor Doug Lane, who published Michael's book Against the Web, many of the other authors I've interviewed so far on the pod. Needlessly said, I had a great blast hearing Doug reminisce on how he got into the publishing industry, some of the ongoing intergenerational tensions on the left, and where left-wing media is going next in the post-Bernie Sanders era, an ongoing conflict in Ukraine. That said, make sure to check out the show notes and links to Doug's new Sublation Media project. And I hope you all enjoyed this week's pod. Cheers. Sweet. Well, okay. Doug, I really appreciate you coming on um, yep. and taking the time to chat with me. I mean, it's a real honor for me to go out and have you on the pod and pick your brains <laughs> about a bit of a veteran uh, in the field now. I mean, because through the conversation I had with uh, Matt and with Ben, um, I'm just kind of figuring out the the chronological age <laughs> of some mm. people on the left and oh, some right. the inter, intergenerational interesting things that are going on there as well. Yeah. Um, mm. And I was just obviously really touched by, you know, all of your connection to, to Michael um, mm -hmm. and his work and who he was personally, uh, you know, yeah. on and off the mic as an individual. So, and for me, I mean, coming in, I mean, I was just been touched by that story. And so to sit down and, and, you know, figure out a bit of the history that's kind of unfolded there around the left, around zero books, the launch of some of their books and some of people's careers and ongoing mm -hmm. careers and stuff like that. It's just, uh, well, I'm look. I've been looking forward to our chat. So thanks for. So you you found out I'm a hundred years old is what you're telling me. Um, <laughs> well, we're both Gen X right off the top. Oh, so I'm okay, a young Gen X. Uh, and obviously, I mean, if I understand correctly, I mean, you're about 50, 51, if I, if I'm That's not right. mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, I mean, I'm, you're, I'm continually shocked by that fact, but yes, it is true. <laughs> cool. Cool. So, but, but I mean, McManus is, I mean, he's a baby when it comes to his involvement, you know, as a, well, I mean, one is an he's intellectual just as, as his, he's his age. I mean, what yeah. is he? He's like 20 something he's 25 maybe well, i think he just really rolled into his 30s if i oh did he correctly oh yeah. okay all right good so yeah. um yeah um because that makes i just i i can't really trust anyone under 30 anyway so i'm glad to know matt <laughs> made it um but uh yeah so um well what, what what i'll say at the outset is that um michael brooks uh brought he came to me to come on to the zero books podcast at that time that's what it, what i was doing that's what i was doing and that's what it was called uh because he was launching the michael brooks show um and uh he had found out about uh, kill all normies which was a book that we'd published um and i was really lucky that he had um the ambition to just try to hit every single left-wing podcast and youtuber and out there um because uh you know he was sitting there in the studio for the majority report and then his own studio in you know, in new york and was a professional and i was sitting exactly where i am right now i haven't moved a bit <laughs> uh, um uh and and but he he brought his energy his ambition his intelligence to my project yeah. um, and like i helped him out with a couple of shows early in his early days along with a whole bunch of other people and we hit it off um and he liked what i was doing i guess enough to really give me a lot of support and um i like to take credit for ben burgess uh success because i asked him to write a book for us but it was michael yeah who came along and said okay ben Doug was right. You have a lot to say, and I'm going to give you even more of a push and a boost. And that just helped everybody. So, yeah. um, yeah, and Michael the, said the, that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the funny story, I guess, as well, I mean, in terms of your, your panel that you guys did out in, in, uh, Bozzy, I think it is, or Idaho. 
It was Idaho, yeah. Idaho. So in terms of how you guys, I think, but that wasn't the first time, if I understand correctly, that you had met Michael. You had met Michael kind of in person before the, the, the panel. Did no, you, or, no, no. It, okay. Well, we had met it. We met for the first time in person yeah. in Idaho, but we had done interview. We talked through interviews and we were working. I think we were already well in, into working on his book. Okay. Zero books at that point. Gotcha. Okay. If I, yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Because yeah, obviously him being in New York and I mean, Ben, if I understand correctly. Oh, wait, maybe, I think I, maybe I had met him in New York first and I'd had a couple of drinks with, the, I went out and met him and I was at the left forum. Okay. And I met him in New York and had, and had beers with him and his crew. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, I did meet him in New York first. And then I met him again in Boise. And I invited him to go to Boise to this Jordan Peterson conference. This yeah. Like, and I apologize. Gonna- I, had, I had to apologize to Ben for that, for this Canadian exports. Well, me and Matt apparently had to ex- <laughs> apologize. <laughs> it was Jordan good, Peterson. right? Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson <laughs> did everybody a big favor by existing. I mean, look. Well, I would I started- have preferred. I, I would prefer if, if, if I could still say as a Canadian, he's a product of the United States. <laughs> uh, look. <laughs> Canadians are no better than the U.S. The <laughs> I, I like citizens. to think I tell myself, or I, I, I try to flatter myself in that way, but clearly not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, Jordan Peterson and and his success was something that helped Zero Books uh, and the YouTube channel that I was making there, because I was able to say, hey, uh, this guy Jordan Peterson that is exciting a lot of young people's uh <clears throat> it seems like a renegade is getting a whole lot of things wrong and yeah. and is not as much of a committed intellectual committed to like free expression and and the free exploration of ideas as he appears to be and you know look we actually exist we on the left who are not his hysterics and are not uh, just wanting to shut shut everybody up who disagrees with us, but are more than happy yeah. to engage with people on the right and people who in, in the center, or people who are socially conservative or fiscally conservative. We can take you all on and enjoy doing so. We won't, we won't, we don't even get upset or break a sweat. This is, this is what we live for. Yeah. Um, and that's what like Ben Bird is really represented and Michael, of course, in yeah. a different way and a much more, uh, multifaceted way no no insult meant for ben burgess represented that as well like the ability to go into any space well even for for matt mcmanus i mean matt's work as well i mean talking his whole work around the postmodern conservative turn and that fits into that as well so i mean whether you call it the new right or postmodern conservatism i mean uh, right and i was really glad for my like for uh, matt's book so i don't i i they connected uh, ben and Matt connected. I I don't remember if they connected in in Boise. Uh, they probably did, but I kind of thought of them as hap- like Matt's book just came to us through the slush pile. Yeah, like I commissioned Ben's book, right? Okay, yeah. I, I knew Ben Bird as, as a short story writer before I ever worked for Zero Books. Before I even started Diet Soap as a podcast, which was my first podcast, I knew of and was friendly with ben burgess through something called live journal okay yeah that? yeah yeah he kind of touched lines. a bit on that because he has a, an mmfa i mean in terms of creative writing so it seems like you you both have a bit of a background in creative writing and yeah and you as well i mean as a published author i mean you've published a slew of books as well which is yeah. i guess kind of the question i want to get at i mean like how you got pulled into zero books how the hell did that happen and <laughs> Well, I was working as a, I, I had been struggling to become a, a, a full-time novelist and writer uh, and was working just kind of crummy jobs uh, in the service sector. I had been working at the Oregon Symphony for many years in the ticket office, Okay. Um, uh, not making a lot of money, but I had, you know, good benefits. Um, and uh, along the way, I, tried, I did, um, I, in the 90s, I had started a zine. And then again, in the, in the early until mid zero years, you know, in two thousands, um, I started again, this zine, it was called diet soap. And, uh, around that time I decided to create a podcast to promote the zine. Okay. 
and the economic crisis hit. Uh, so around 2009 is when I started the podcast, actually. And um, I found myself slowly just mothballing the printed zine and focusing on doing this interview podcast, which for me was about like rediscovering my interest in philosophy because I had majored in philosophy as an undergrad and, and rediscovering my interest in um, politics. Not that I hadn't been interested in politics before, but approaching politics from a perspective of inquiry rather than from a commit, like a, a kind of ideological commitment to a certain sort of Chomsky influenced anarchism, which is okay. like, which been, as like, instead of, I looked at the world and thought, and especially the economic crisis and thought, I don't understand what's going on. I need to talk to people who do. And so for about five years, I did a podcast called Diet Soap, where I just tried to get the, the smartest people I could find to, to explain what was going on. And it meant, you know, exploring the history of socialism. It meant talking to Marxist economic professors. Um, and it also meant talking to people who were uh, you know, out of their uh, tree. You know? <laughs> it was like, uh, I talked to new age gurus and. Well, that's uh, the, the, the weird thing type. too about zero bucks, because I mean, uh, the, the publishing house behind it in terms of John Hunt, I mean, that is, it's a mind, body, spirit sort of house that mm -hmm. eventually, mm -hmm. I mean, started publishing zero books because of Mark Fisher. Well, that's not exactly accurate, but okay. <laughs> what really happened, it, I mean, Mark Fisher was, as far as I know, he was um, initially an author that Tariq Goddard commissioned okay. to, pub to write for zero books. And zero books was a left politics and philosophy imprint that Tariq yeah. Goddard, who was a novelist, um, started and he was friends with John Hunt. He, he, his family knew John Hunt's family. They lived next door okay, uh, down the road. And, and he just went to John Hunt and said, Hey, I want to start an imprint on, in your, at your publishing company. I have a bunch of people I can call upon in London okay. who are left, who are kind of left theorists. Um, I have some books already, like I can grab. I mean, I don't know all the details, but he managed to convince John Hunt to let him start an imprint that was different from the other kinds of imprints, but that weren't, that, that was in the beginning, maybe not as different as you might think, like, like object oriented ontology was a big part of what yeah. they published at the beginning. And, um, uh, it, uh, so, but it was Tariq pessimism. that had the connection to John Hunt. Okay. Cause I yeah, mean, obviously but, like me doing my research, I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll, I mean, I, in terms of my connection to Michael, I mean, I connected to Michael through Matt McManus's work. I started to, a friend of mine in South Africa like, uh, told me, he's like, listen, you need to get on jo Jordan Peterson. It's like, what are you talking about? Who is this Jordan Peterson? And I'm like, and why is my buddy from South Africa telling me about this prof up in Toronto? So I was like, what the hell? So then that's when he skyrocketed to fame. And I was like, what the hell is mm -hmm. going on? So like kind of everybody around that time. So when I got online, I started to see some of Matt's writing circulating around. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was, was that like, myth and mayhem? Was that when he was working on myth and mayhem? No, I mean, it was a few articles that he had written for Quillette mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on Habermas and my interest in critical theory is, it, 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 you know, came on board. I'm like, well, how the hell, or what the hell is this Quillette thing? And why, the, who the hell is this kid writing this stuff about? Habermas and some stuff around postmodern conservatism. So I just picked up a, a few of his his writings and started to follow him online. And that's when he started to go and befriend Burgess. And that's when he, they all came online. Uh, for me personally, as as authors. Um, but the interesting thing is, is I mean, obviously Jacobin was always, uh, you know, from somebody from up in Montreal. I mean, in terms of left politics, I mean, I considered myself a, a progressive. Mm -hmm. What is going on with this thing? <clears throat> I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, my mic just went kind of funny or my earphones are. Okay, cool. So okay. But when I, I got uh, introduced to those guys, I mean, not that I was 
illiterate in terms of left politics. A very, you know, I'm from Montreal, and I mean, obviously, come from a very progressive, uh, left leaning sort of family and stuff like that. And obviously, I would read Jacobin and everything else, but it's not something that I went out and go and pay attention to that much. But once Matt came online, and I start to follow some of his writing, and I mean, he was just speaking my language in terms of some of the studies that I was doing in religious mm-hmm. studies around critical theory. So I got interested in him as an author. So I watched his kind of career, you know, kind of shoot to like, you know, skyrocket in terms of his publishing and obviously his book type stuff. And that's Mm -hmm. when I got onto Ben and I'd already known about zero books in the past because of Mark Fisher. But I mean, it's not something I guess I paid attention to in terms of the nitty gritty sort of history of it. So once I saw all of you guys kind of coalescing and then Michael came into the mix, I was like, wow, this is really interesting what the fuck is going on <laughs> you know mm-hmm. like this is this is something new and then once i saw michael i start to listen to michael much more closely and then he had jeremy johnson on and jeremy johnson his interest in uh gene gepser and some stuff around integral theory mm-hmm. and i was just like wow that is bizarre like because i grew up on some ken wilbur type stuff up here in montreal and got very interested in buddhism and that's why i ended up in religious studies and got pulled Mm. into some stuff around critical theory through my university days so Mm. it brought all this stuff back for me into the mix Mm -hmm. so when i start to see these dynamics going on i was just like wow this is fucking cool like this is and i was like but i'm like i start to feel my age (laughs) <laughs> looking at some of this mm. i was like you know like there is an element of millennial socialism that is new that is really coming online and listening to some of the younger guys some guys like matt you know in terms of how his political consciousness kind of came around and how the 2000 you know 2008 financial stuff you know kind of hit and had a huge impact on him but his interpretation was different as me as a sort of gen x mm. so when I listen to Ben and then I start to listen to tons, much more closely to some of your stuff and some of the publishing activities that you guys were doing, I was like, wow, this is fucking cool. Like I need to, I want to know more about the history and the personal relationships kind of mm-hmm. going on and burgeoning there on the left. And I guess that's kind of my question to you, listening to a few of your pods now, do you think that there is some sort of kind of intergenerational sort of transmission kind of going on on the left? And there is a new generation of, <laughs> of leftists uh, that are coming up and well there has to be right yeah. i mean there um if there's going to be a left that can learn from its own history yeah until um aubrey de gray gets its way gets his way which by the way i'm wholly on board with him i know a lot of people on the left would not be but he's a longevity researcher okay so like you know like trying to overcome the natural process of aging but until that happens and it may be a long long time um (laughs) the way that the left learns from its past is by learning through the generations that means the older leftists informing the younger and then learning also from the you know the younger generation uh experimenting and, and teaching the older generation new things but um yeah that certainly I mean, I think here, here's how I, I, what I think has happened. I think the new left, the sixties and seventies left, Mm -hmm. the boomers have dominated, uh, uh, for, for a long, long time. Um, (laughs) and, and, um, and not only did they dominate directly as individuals, but the, the strength of their ideas, um, and the depth of the uh of their institutions i mean it's the kind of roots that were putting put down in the 60s um and the way in which uh the boomer uh left was integrated into the academic world yeah all of that has given uh the sensibility of the new left uh this of the 60s um and many of its different ideas and problems uh, you know, a long life to be yeah. recreated in the left of Generation X, which was marginal, small, small little cohort, um, and to really be uh, repeated uh, on the millennial left. Yeah. Um, uh, not and that Michael, the boomers, but Michael kind of. I mean, obviously, he's uh, 
Well, I mean, he's a millennial technically, but he's like Burgess. I mean, <laughs> Burgess was laughing as I, I was laughing too. He's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, I'm a millennial. <laughs> he's like, like he's a 41 year old millennial, you know? And he was like, he's like, yeah, but you know, like, when is that going to go out and come to pass as well? So, but Ben and him are, are, you know, of that generation in a certain way. So I thought it was interesting. And that's why I want to go out and <laughs> talk to you next. Cause you're, you're my age. I mean, you're gen, you're well, gen I mean, X. Gen- Generation X, by the way, is anyone who was born from 1965 to 1980. And I guess, yeah. and Burgess was born, what, 81? He, yeah, he said he's turning 42, 41. So he's born right on the, he said he was born in 81, if I understand correctly. Yeah. Okay. And so like, you know, that's, yeah. he's pra- I mean, he's, you know, <laughs> I, 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 compared to my oldest son, Okay, yeah. 20, 25, born in 1996. You know, he is uh So that's a that's a millennial for you, yeah. Is well, it? no, he, no, I really think he's a zoomer, but he refuses to say he's a zoomer cuz he was right on the cusp. Okay. Zoomer and millennial. He's on the opposite side. But I think like really my son who's 25 is actually a zoomer and I think really Burgess is a Gen Xer. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. yeah, but I mean that—that that was kind of the feel I got from him, anyways, as well. I mean, in, in but, listening but, but to Michael, Michael would be still younger, and uh, you know, but Michael would be what? How old would he be now? Thirty-seven, thirty-eight, if he was still around? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He passed so, away at thirty-six. Yeah, yeah. He so he would he would be. I mean, he always was. A, he really is a millennial. That <laughs> Michael was a, was a millennial, and um. Yeah, and and of course, uh, uh, Matt McGannis, absolutely a millennial. Yeah. Um, uh, so, right, but Burgess, I think. I'm sorry, Burgess, you're Gen X too, buddy. <laughs> and 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 okay. Uh, well, this is the other thing too that came up in the conversation with Burgess uh, is, is that Burgess had some questionable leanings in terms of your left cred here, in terms of saying that you're more of a hippie than you are a socialist. So I want Burgess said that about me. <laughs> Kind of like Michael. Apparently, this is the tension that apparently Michael was a bit on the hippy dippy, which I I relate to very much because, I mean, I grew up in that sort of like you know yoga Buddhist sort of flavor background of my parents that eventually ditched Christianity and Catholicism up here in Montreal. All right, I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I have to <laughs> cut this conversation short. I have to call up Ben Burgess. What? All right. Well, look. Well, the conver- the conversation you had about, I guess, kind of his post uh, Joe Rogan conversation, right? Where you know you guys were kind of talking about some stuff around God. Uh, oh, his conversation oh. with uh, Robert Wright and stuff like that. Uh, right. So yeah. it kind of came up. You know, you guys were kind of joking back and forth, and he just right. kind of said right. back to you as well that you know you're yeah, but you're a hippie, you know. So. <laughs> God, okay. <laughs> No, I'm like, look, I mean, who am I to deny it? Uh, I live in Portland. I've been here since 1991. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, you know, I was, I, I, I came up in Colorado Springs as a you know kid. Uh, my only way of being a, on the left in Colorado Springs was to, you know, take up uh, the progressive Unitarian peace and love left you know as opposed <laughs> yeah. to the mi- militaristic focus on the family uh you know buzz cut right no, dominated no, yeah, yeah, for yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah right so um i wasn't you know but nonetheless i would say that while i might be culturally more of a hippie than burgess is that i think that i'm more of a marxist than he is Ah, okay. (laughs) So, um, you can, if you ever talk to me again, tell him I said so. (laughs) And, and, but the, by that, I mean, like, you know, he, he is, well, he's, he's an analytic philosopher. Yeah. There was that that came up through the conversation as well. Right. Because of his studies. Yeah. And I'm a, you know, autodidactic Hegelian, which makes me closer to Marx because Marx was Hegelian, not, he wasn't some, Rawlsian or Marx didn't, you know, take the linguistic turn or. Yeah. No. And I mean, he said he almost lost it too. I mean, cause Ben's background is interesting. Cause when he went into, 
his kind of analytic kind of graduate studies and stuff like that. I mean, he kind of dropped out politically for a while. Like he didn't, you know, a lot. I mean, obviously if you're doing graduate studies, you can do your MA and PhD. I mean, how much can you actually go out and uh, focus in on politics? But uh, I mean, he said that the most formidable sort of political things that happened was obviously some stuff around uh, 9-11 and then obviously the the war type stuff in Iraq. So that, so in a way, I mean, I relate much more to, to Ben as well as a Gen X, right? Because those were the memories I have in the in the 90s mm. moving in through that period there. But um, I guess that's free. I mean, because for you, I mean, your formidable sort of political coming online moments for you, I mean, what would it be? Because you're a bit older than us. I mean, what would you say were the big, well, you know, I mean, politically, I, I, you, you, you really sort of, you know, came online in terms of. Well, I mean, I started my decisions. podcast in 2009, right? So, okay. And <clears throat> podcasting changed the way that I related to being online okay. completely. You know, I was suddenly reaching well outside of my bubble. Uh, by being a podcaster, I was hearing from people all across the world and across the United States. Certainly people were rural, people were urban. Uh, admittedly, somehow all of them men, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, well outside my bubble. <laughs> um, and because uh, like when I was first online uh, in the 90s, as someone who was writing short fiction and trying to make it in science fiction world the people I connected to online were all other science fiction writers and yeah. through a, 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 a platform called live journal. Um, and it was, you know, if you had 200 followers on live journal, you were big. Okay. You know, um, and it, it, or at least that's how I remember it. And, uh, you know, when I went into podcasting, got on Facebook and on Twitter, um, then the, the, the range of people I could communicate with and reach was much bigger. Um, and then by the time uh, Michael came into the picture, uh, it seemed like the podcasting internet world was beginning to devour mainstream media. Yeah. Like that's why you had this figure like uh, Michael Brooks who was coming out of New York media as an internet celebrity. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting thing. Um, well, cause everything post 2010, cause I mean, even Jacobin, you know, as a founding, I mean, zero books is an interesting founding years as well. Now that I think back on it in terms of things that were popping up, you know, around that time. Right. And how you guys were trying to go and change some of the discourse as well. Right. I mean, it's the same thing with Jacobin. I mean, and I don't know if I agree with, I mean, because we kind of touched on it a bit there, right, is that somehow this is some sort of millennial socialism wave. And when I was talking to Ben, I, you know, I felt that that's a way for, you know, particularly older Gen X that might be go and can be considered libs or even people that might be to the right. I mean, even the Jonathan Heights, you know, Jordan Peterson type types, right, they can go and try and smear this as a sort of, you know, postmodern neo-marxist whatever right and it's it sticks because well, let's, there's, let's a, there's about... this there's this millennial sort of you know their students are millennials right so they're just shitting on that kind of thing and then that's where i really start to go and start to to, to think about this much more and then that's what i want to go and launch my podcast is that i'm like wait a minute there's a lot of history here that needs to be talked about and these connections need to go and be unpacked a bit more and that you know some of these you know, institutions like, you know, like Zero Books and, uh, you know, the publishing houses that popped up around those particular times, the books that were published during those times, the magazines uh, was, you know, shifting the landscape. And so it was, it was also happening on the right. But to me, the left is an interesting ecosystem to go and talk about. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to kind of sit with you and, you know, yeah. your brains well, about that. Let's let's talk about postmodern and neo-Marxism in a way uh, for a minute. Yeah. Um, OK, so if I'm hearing you correctly, like what you're a little skeptical about the idea that the millennial generation came along with as they came, got older, uh, developed a kind of uh, socialist politics that was new. You're skeptical about that claim. 
No, I, I mean, I'm not, I mean, in a certain way, skeptical of it. I just think it's, I mean, it was there and it was happening because of the, well, obviously the 2000 financial eight, uh, you know, uh, crash. But I mean, as somebody that grew up in the 90s and that, you know, that was struggling, you know, very much along sort of Michael's lines, you know, personally from a family perspective and from mm -hmm. my own, you mm -hmm. know, being able to put myself through college and, you know, and keep a roof over my head, having to work two, three jobs while I'm going to university. I was like, no, fuck that. And I mean, we were being devoured very much during that whole period from the 80s into the 90s and that it was neoliberalism, you know, ramping up to some frightening degree mm -hmm. um and that 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 did go out and you know people that were i think that grew up during those years and now some of this these millennials that kind of grew up in families around that as well that you know the political consciousness has been molded to be sensitive to these dynamics mm -hmm. so i'm not skeptical of it at all i'm just kind of fascinated how this has kind of all come about and that you know the, how it pick, got picked up and moved into the whole bernie movement oh, oh I, well i just started being skeptical of the claim that the millennials were a new socialist uh move but uh, but what i think you what i misheard you on that because you were saying that it that 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 the reason that you would want to push back on that is uh, this maybe a jason idea that the millennial generation itself is somehow decadent or uh soft or oh fuck um, no you no know way, like, no. What, what, I, what, I don't what, buy what, that at all i, no, I think that's, this... that's that's the jordan peterson sort of jonathan height right that you know college right, kids right, today exactly. are a bunch of fucking snowflakes yeah, right. and i think right, they're right. Full of shit. you want to right yeah. so, <laughs> like, so like, you don't want to connect the reason you want to be skeptical about the millennials bringing on a new kind of socialism is because that term millennial through people like Haidt and Peterson itself is uh, something to be mocked because uh, yeah. it has to, it, it, it's like millennials, the ones that take selfies and can't, and, and uh, you know, can't stop tweeting or can't get off Instagram. The millennials, the ones who've never had to really work in their life and the millennials, the ones who, um, you know, I've always gotten the, the participation trophies and didn't never. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. This, this is the, this is the rhetoric that you're pushing against. But yeah. And for me, um, it's triggering as well, because, you know, as a Gen X, I, I always kind of felt that as well, kind of along with boomers. Right. That boomers would be kind of smearing us in a certain way along those particular lines that Gen X are kind of. <laughs> look, know, like, I just remember <laughs> that the boomers, you know, were accused of being everything yeah <laughs> that that the millennials were accused of being and and it's and true, yeah. with a bit more justification because the the boomers were born at a time of an economic boom right? yeah. that's one of the that's one of the connotations of boomer i mean it was actually a baby boom that we're talking about but it, that baby boom came along with an economic boom after world war ii hmm. their parents had seen the fucking war yeah their their grandparents and uh, had had really suffered as adults through the depression yeah you know and these are kids who are living on the land of television grocery stores yeah interstate highways yeah automobiles electricity you know you go back to generations and electricity was not universal yeah. so sure that, yeah you want to talk about a soft the first generation to be called soft and unnecessarily rebellious it wasn't probably even the boomers it was probably the silent generation before that but nonetheless like that accusation about the generational uh, politics has been around cert since certainly the boomers and they were the first ones to be the <laughs> you know the me generation and exactly. all of that right so um so okay so the, you know millennials are just the same as it ever was if, if that's how yeah. they are right exactly um, yeah. every every generation of young people are soft spoiled little brats <laughs> who needs to be taken they all need to be taken out to the shed given a good spanking <laughs> they need a little patriarchal authority in their lives they're not getting enough you know stand up stand up straight and clean up your room before you yeah go exactly <laughs> And I tell all of my children this and they all laugh at me. But the point <laughs> is, um, but but the point is like, okay, this neo-Marxism and postmodernism, 
that Jordan Peterson talks about. It doesn't have anything really to do with this generational stuff. It, it has to do with the turn after World War II um, and the beginnings of the failure of the Soviet Union to try, turn away from Marxism, mm. away from grand, I mean, uh, grand political projects and towards uh, a more privatized, individualized form of uh, managerial and reformist politics. So like after World War II and fascism and, and then let's say the Khrushchev's uh, silent uh, uh, secret speech admitting mm -hmm. all the crimes of Stalin and the Hungarian revolution, um, you had, uh, you know, the sort of questioning of the workerist, uh, Stalinist um, Marxism that had come to define the socialist Marxist project. And instead a focus on um, movement building and on uh, 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 other forms of oppression rather than exploitation. So, you know, the gay liberation movement, the feminist movement, uh, the black liberation movement, they all came up around that time. Um, and then also in the academy, there was a, a desire to break with big explanations and focus on empowering individual consciousness. And, um, and, you know, I think that has a lot to do with postmodernity and cultural relativism sort of comes along with that. So all of these things, though, have to be understood, in my opinion, as being contained within the project which everybody, no matter whether they're on the right or left, left. in the developed world is participating in, which is modernization and industrialization and the revolution away from traditional feudal or you know self-sustaining rural life towards a global industrious financial economy um that's that, what's been but, developed but that's something that you were involved in as well if i understand correctly because that's kind of something that i want to touch because a few times of, or a few of the pods that i've listened to well let me let me finish the thought here about the financial okay. economy like yeah. what's that saying is that i'm for modernization industrialization all those things right but it's it's not it's filled with contradictions and socialism is just is the vision of socialism is the vision of taking up the, this new revolutionary world, the modern world, and fully realizing it, working through its contradictions, getting getting to a to getting so that it's self-actualizing. It's that means individuals get to participate in history, they get to shape the world, and you know what they are shaping is our whole collectivity, yeah. where we have self-responsibility. Whereas the conservatives are saying, well, let's hold on to what we have let's hold on to the system of exploitation that we have the capitalist capitalist system capitalism is not the full extent of modernity it isn't realizing the enlightenment project completely um and marxism was a was part of the enlightenment project that wanted to modernize industrialize the world bring the world into together empower humanity that's the vision and that's the vision of everybody all these right-wing critics too it's just they're just not, you know, instead, the left gets cast as romantics. The left gets ca cast as, but yeah, kind of, they're the ones who want to go back to get to nature. They're the ones who want to get away from civilization. They're anti-society, but they're not. The, the left is the one who wants to complete the societal project, the global project. Okay, now I've said enough. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, because the anti-globalization sort of movements and, you know, events as well throughout the 90s and stuff like that, obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, Seattle, uh, Quebec City and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, that's another reason why I want to go and talk to you a bit, because I mean, those not that Ben, um, Ben would have remembered those, but that he didn't seem to go out and be that aware of those. But for me, when I was, you know, you know, going from high school into what we hear, if you hear up in Montreal, we have SAGEP because we don't have, uh, you know, longer high school. And then basically we fall into university. I mean, those were particular events along with the wars, obviously the, you know, the Middle Eastern wars that were very prominent for me 
you know, in terms of those particular events going out and molding my consciousness or my mm. sort of kind of politically com- coming online. Um, but it did get hijacked in a certain way around the, t- you know, the, uh, the Twin Towers and, uh, you know, the terrorist attack on, you know, in New York because of the sort of clash of civilizations that kind of came on there, so-called clash of civilization around some mm-hmm. issues around culture, which is an interesting, you know, like when I think about Michael in terms of how he was kind of going to war, not only with Peterson, but also going to war with <laughs> Sam Harris uh, and some of those guys and in Ben's, you know, interests as well and, and Christopher Hitchens and stuff like that. And some of those guys, so, the, you know, like I'm just finding myself now, you know, kind of, you know, moving into my mid forties, reflecting back on this and being like, what the fuck just happened? You know, like, I feel like, like I want to have these more sort of historical conversations and sort of reconstruct, you know, that history in a certain way and talk about it and be like, wait a minute, man, like a lot has happened. Right. And that mm-hmm. we seem to be getting so caught up a lot of the times, I think, in terms of, you know, just the moment of current events instead of just kind of reflecting back and being like, you know, like, where were we and where are we now that along some of these events? And for me, Michael is just, you know, just smacked me in the face in terms of, you know, him passing away in that loss there kind of on the left. Uh, mm-hmm. And obviously the, the whole kind of Bernie, you know, movement kind of coming to obviously in the broad halt because of mm-hmm. Biden, you know, I'm finding myself reminiscing or trying to figure out, you know, and repeat some of those connections and that history. So that's why, you know, like I want to go out and reach out to you and to Ben and to, to Matt, mm-hmm. because I mean, everything that you guys are doing and everything that you guys have been doing uh, has been so intertwined and, 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 <laughs> you know, formative for a lot of people you know, in terms of the books that you guys have published, the podcasts you guys have done. I mean, the amount of output that you've put out along with Ben and Michael mm-hmm. and now young guys like Matt, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool mm-hmm. to, to, to sift through that. You know, somebody has, especially for me up in Montreal and going through that and I'm being like, well, that's what's going on in the States, you know, and now and I'm thinking even around zero books, um, like this is, I guess, another question I'd have for you is that, I mean, because Zero Books was a UK movement and you're in the States, right? Yeah. So there is this UK America back and forth. Well, I took that, over in 2014 after the original crew had left and it yeah. became an American run project around that time. Now it's gone back to the UK. They bought the company and got rid of me. Um, and, uh, uh, but but even that buyout, I mean, like Watkins is a f- strange publishing house, just as much as John Hunt. Like that's like yeah. an occultist. Like as somebody from background in religious studies that has an interest in critical theory, I'm like looking at that. I'm like, that is bizarre. What is that publishing house, and why did they? <laughs> why do they have this? Zero, Look, you there's know, a this very simple, it's a yeah. very simple explanation. Yeah, it's a business. Yeah, and uh, you know they'll publish in whatever niche will sell books. And one of them happens to be this sort of flaky Western Marxist, new age, postmodern neo-Marxist tradition. And <clears throat> I'd say that only half in jest, like, yeah. Um, Cause I'm trying to throw stones at the people who replace <laughs> me. But, um, the, like uh, critical theory in the United States and in, and in U- Europe and the UK, but, has lost, you know, along those lines, like I was saying in the in the 70s and 80s and after World War II in general, the the academic left lost hold of the Marxist tradition and went mm. off in a bunch of different directions, um, became absorbed by, I think, just liberal capitalism, um, became somewhat reformist, started focusing on esoteria, um, became more romantic and <clears throat> that's what you find in you know uh, that's one of the things that we're doing battle with on the left within ourselves it's like okay do we want power or not mm. do we want to change the material conditions or are we satisfied with just trying to accommodate ourselves to the world as it's going are we going to look within and change our mental space so that no matter what happens we'll be fine because we can crawl inside our little 
cha- you know, interior chambers and protect ourselves from the harsh realities of the world by going within? Or are we going to turn outward again and say, okay, no, we need political power. We need to change the, the means of production. We need to emancipate working people. We need to change the way we work collectively, not just how we think individually. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like a lot of um, the left, even the really sophisticated, smart leftists have sort of uh, uh, accepted that the major uh, thing that needs to be altered is the interior of our minds rather than the world as we organize it together. And um, and uh, and anyway, how do my casting stones at zero books? As I've left that uh, that focus on the outside world, that focus on trying to change the the means the who, who controls how the means of production are organized, that Marxism that I tried to bring to it has has been ejected um, yeah. along with me. Um, and so, you know, I picked up uh, the critical theory of uh, of the zero books that I was, you know, and some of the best of it, you know, I really liked, but nonetheless that, that I feel is, was that neo-Marxism that Peterson rails against really. And I tried to bring actual Marxism to it. Um, well, the whole Zizek, back. the whole Zizek Peterson debate is, is a clear you know, indication. I think of, you know, people talking past one another in a certain way. And I mean, particularly in terms of Peter, I think not seeing the full complexity of what's going on on the left. And mm-hmm. that was really my conversation with Matt as well. I think Matt does a great job going out and really breaking it up and saying, wait a minute, you know, like you can't go out and do these sweeping, <laughs> these smear campaigns, like history and these movements and this thought is much more complicated than that. But to me, I, I guess the, the zero books kind of, because of Mark Fisher in a certain way. Well, let's way. talk about, we need to talk about sublation before we leave. Cause oh, I'm for not sure. Yeah. Books, yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, mm-hmm. like this is to me as well is that there's new institutions and new media platforms that have been popping up and, and growing out of all of this as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Old ones are dying. Some of them are shifting and adapting. I mean, I was quite enamored with one of the conversations you had with, um, I can't remember his name now, but you guys were talking about how Bass Carson's car has gone over to the nation now and mm-hmm. that, you know, there is this sort of realignment and shifting going on right now at the left uh, in terms of how, you know, like the old school magazines kind of like obviously the nation or even dissent, you know, is stacking up against, you know, newer, you know, uh, publications kind of like Jack. I think it might've been Spencer Leonard. Okay. That I was talking to. Yeah. Who's one of, who's our editor in chief at sublation magazine which is going to okay. debut in may sweet um, yeah I, I look i think that we're we definitely are in a transition i think i think the, the millennial left had a moment a long run and that uh generation x never did have its moment and i'm that's why i'm still around but um <laughs> you know so we're still here is because we're like still trying to figure things out yeah but um millennials had their moment it, it culminated in the bernie sanders campaign and now many of them are going to stay on the left but that moment ended it's ended yeah and we are and all of the media ecosphere that grew up around it is in crisis yeah or shifting or it's going to be moving around it's got it's got to move around because i think it's really in crisis we're going to be that's you know like uh like overall um the media overall, like not just left media, uh, has been struggling. The Trump era was good for it. Yeah. The Biden era has been bad for it. Bad for CNN, bad for left wing media on YouTube, bad for newspaper sales. Mm. Um, and the end of COVID is also bad for you. Know, COVID was great for us. Everyone's locked in at home. What do they have to do? Watch, watch the Internet. Mm. Now they're actually leaving their homes again. Oh no. How are we going to get their attention? Um, but <clears throat> my task at sublation right now is to figure out how to make the project of socialism uh, recognizable to the millennials that are still interested and to zoomers who are coming up 
um, and who, who are facing all the same problems that we did when we mm. were young, yeah. that the millennials did, and only intensified. Each time it's more intensified. Like these kids that are um, young Zoomers, they just went through their formative years. Like my kid who's 17, just went through his teenage years where he, he hit puberty and got locked down. Yeah, it's fucked up. Yeah. Yeah, he does. You know, his, <clears throat> he doesn't. He says, "I can't. I don't know how to socialize." Yeah, I feel out of shape at seventeen because I've been locked in. Yeah, uh, um, it doesn't seem to me there's any future for me to even think about. You know, why? Why? What am I supposed to be doing? I have no idea. You know, we're all locked in, and the world's ending, and so why should I care about my future? Yeah, you know. Now my kid knows how to play me. But nonetheless, this is what he tells me, you know. Like, well, I mean, just putting myself yeah. in their shoes. I mean, like if mm-hmm. I think back, literally, like when I was, you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, in my my late teens, moving into my early twenties, and I was facing this kind of crisis, or even just the, you know, just the, you know, the general atmosphere of what's going on. I have no, mm-hmm. I, I mean, Doug, I can't be. I mean, I have, I have no idea how I would handle it. I mean, I was already a fucking driving everybody nuts around me anyways at that. <laughs> so right now no so i can only no. imagine what it's like so but yeah i mean so like on uh, my task is to say look zoomer kid look uh lost adult it's not it's not so hopeless and if we just allow ourselves to think together yeah and and push past our the how uneasy it makes us to realize that we've had a lot of failures we have an opportunity still. We still have an opportunity to react, and change is happening. Yeah, not just not just um, on the left, not just between millennials and Zoomers, but also, you know, the Trump phenomenon and uh, the, the the economic crisis, the Trump phenomenon, the the lockdowns, now the war in Ukraine. As horrible as it all kind of is, it marks the end of an era oh fuck the yeah. long end of neoliberalism of that solution that started with carter and and is now <clears throat> really ending with biden that 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 globalized financialized deregulated neoliberalism what's coming next isn't going to be pretty or better it could be another world war yeah it could be neoliberalism ends with a couple of mushroom clouds we don't know but whatever it is ending, that is changing. There's going to be a new way of operating within capitalism. And whenever there's a change like that, that also means there are openings for people who want to push beyond capitalism, I think. Yeah. No, oh, and that was the upshot too, in terms of my conversation with Matt. And uh, I mean, even with Ben is that, you know, that there is this sort of next left that is, that is morphing and coming out of, you know, of this history now, right? And mm-hmm. that, you know, people are rethinking and, re, you know, and I mean, obviously guys like you that are starting up, you know, new platforms and new ways of viewing that history. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm so excited. I mean, like the stuff that I've been seeing online around sublation and you, the old crew that you have, mm-hmm. right? And where they are now too, in terms of their own, you know, thinking and career and, you know, and where mm-hmm. they're moving. And I mean, guys like Matt now, all of a sudden, you know, as a young professor going to be moving into you know, the universities in a certain way, replacing those old boomers, those old leftists there and bringing on a whole new line of, of thinking. So it is exciting. I'm, I am excited, but like you, I'm, I'm scared shitless to, <laughs> right. to think about some of the other consequences, but the history that I've been thinking around Michael and what he accomplished at such a young age and just the ecosystem that was around him and the networks that he built and the connections and the relationships. I mean, that's not going away. I mean, it, to mm. me, it just seems like you guys are getting started in a certain way. Right. I mean, you guys are gearing up literally for like round two. And we that, are. I mean, and that's yeah. why I think sublation. I've, got, is, I've had investors. I have yeah. a team of people around me. We're just about to launch on May 1st, which is, you know, a, a big holiday for the left. Okay. May Day. <laughs> it is. It's a big, you know, the, it's it's uh, in remembrance of the uh, uh, struggle for the uh, 40 hour work week or the eight hour work, work yeah. eight hour work day and the Haymarket uh, tragedy and and um, the you know struggle for workers liberation. 
that's me yeah. that's may 1st every year well that's what we're, that's when we're gonna launch Sweet. so uh, people should tune into that well I'll try to find us on youtube excellent look up yeah. sublation <laughs> you know i'll put that in the show notes most definitely yeah. i'll push that stuff out as well and it's been coming I, up as well too through through matt and uh i mean obviously through his feeds and burgess as well and uh i mean they seem just as excited as well to go out and take on some of these other kind of new right sort of type stuff as well happening so th- there's this sharpening of the knives going on <laughs> as well right on ev- all sides and intellectually it's 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 fervent ground so I mean, I, I mean, I really appreciate the time you coming on and, and talking about this. I mean, I'd love to, you know, to have you back on at some point or even, you know, get you yeah, to I'd love some to. of the, some of that history a bit more. Yeah. Um, I'd love to do that. It, um, you know, unfortunately today I have to push on my, I have to file my taxes. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks a lot for having me on Eric. And oh, uh, I really, uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll put all that in the show notes. And uh, I, I, I hope this kickoff for uh, for sublation is is a big bang for you. And this is going to be an interesting part of your own journey as well. So yeah. I've been watching with fascination. Cool, man. All right, all right. Thank you. Bye. All the best, bud. <laughs>